discussion. And we'll now move on uh, to the second paper of this panel, uh, which is Yuval Evnat and Hila Shamir's paper, uh, Bilateral Labor Agreements, Who Are They Good For? What Are They Good For? Uh, Yuval and Hila, both of our Trash Lab program here at Tel Aviv University. So hi, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, so thank you very much again for joining us. And uh, we've changed the title of our talk. <laughs> As you can see, Sorry. that's fine. It's not in the program. So, uh, you know, and, and I co-wrote the program. So that all shows all of you this was very last minute. Um, but um, yeah, so I think that our change will also reflect what I'm going to say and what we're going to present. So I'm going to start and then Yuval is, Yuval is going to take uh, uh, to continue after me. So this paper continues a series of articles that many of you in this conference actually wrote <laughs> asking the question, why do countries enter bilateral labor agreements, BLAs, to govern international labor migration? Yuval and I began this journey particularly interested in what we are focused on a trap lab, and that's the role of BLAs in protecting workers' rights and preventing labor exploitation. I think many of us writing about BLAs are interested in BLAs for this reason, maybe among others. We had two wonderful research assistants, Yosef Brander and Mais Abdallah, who are both here, I think. So thank you guys, and thanks for joining us. And they read through about 90 or so BLAs in English and Arabic from the last 20 years and analyzed and coded them according to different criteria we set out. And, and, and Adam and Bartok will be very happy to show you what, what we've done. I think it will be less sophisticated maybe than what you guys have done. We'll discuss that. Anyway, as we read uh, the BLAs, we found it more and more difficult to stick with the idea that migrant workers' protection is in any way an explanation or a motivation to BLAs at all, at least when we look at the documents. Half of the BLAs we reviewed, 45 out of 90, included some form of general clause granting migrant workers the same or similar, slightly lower, rights and protections available to all workers in the receiving country. And only a third included a model contract that provided more detailed elaboration of these rights, not necessarily a lot more. Uh, but none of them included enforcement mechanisms. And absent enforcement mechanisms, there's no reason to think that the weak protections provided in VLAs and model contracts translate to protections on the ground. In fact, as many of you know and discuss in your papers, there's hardly any evidence, anecdotal or systemic, suggesting that BLAs actually improve workers' rights on the ground. Reading the BLAs and the academic literature about this, we came up with a bleaker, much less rosy theory about why countries enter BLAs that we call a control thesis. In our paper, we present a thesis that a strong complementary motive that animates BLAs is the shared interest of countries in policing and controlling the migrant workers uh, and the illicit recruitment industry that developed around migration. So just to kind of set the scene as the title of this panel calls for, uh, what does the literature identify as the reasons countries uh, enter BLAs? Um, so why do countries enter uh, BLAs? A common explanation offered in the literature is that BLAs are signed mostly between wealthy countries of the global north who are experiencing labor shortages in developing countries seeking to protect the rights of their nationals in the migration process. We all know this is not exactly accurate because there's also South to South and various others, but kind of generally speaking. And in this analysis, sending countries compete against one another in order to open up labor markets to their citizens and increase the flow of remittances and receiving countries set the terms of BLAs at their almost complete discretion because of that. BLAs, therefore, are expected to represent mostly the interests of receiving countries, with possibly some minimal concessions to sending countries, and to include clauses related to those elements that receiving countries cannot achieve independently, mainly facilitating the movement of qualified workers to areas or industries for which they have a critical need as efficiently as possible, and then assisting in the, in the worker's departure once their guest visa expires or is violated. This analysis tends to downplay or almost disregard the role of sending countries in BLAs. It also minimizes the responsibility of sending countries in uh, securing rights for their citizens. It doesn't explain how come BLA negotiations are so long, uh, some taking months and even years. 
and why some sentient countries prefer migration via BLA. This is the case with the Philippines um, that we discussed, and uh, at times even condition migration on BLAs, as is the case in Ethiopia and Indonesia and Nepal that Ayushman will discuss soon. Further, this char characterization of BLAs does not provide an explanation of additional characteristics of BLAs, including their non-uniformity, a general lack of enforceability and non-bindingness, and the secrecy surrounding many BLAs. And then comes the control secrecy. So our review of BLAs uh, and of the secondary literature leads us to put forward a complementary explanation as to why countries enter BLAs. A control thesis. We suggest that the shared interests of sending and receiving countries in policing and controlling the movement of migrant workers and curtail the illicit recruitment industry that develops around migration is a key and mostly hidden motivation for countries to enter BLAs. To be clear, this motivation does not contradict the power relations and interest analysis already identified in the literature, but rather only complements it and adds an additional dimension to our understanding of BLAs. We believe identifying and recognizing the strong shared interests of both countries in control can explain some of the more puzzling characteristics of BLAs. First, identifying this shared interest could explain their growing popularity, despite the lack of evidence that they increase migration flows and remittances or improve migrant workers' rights. Second, this could also explain why BLL, BLAs are non-binding. Presumably, when both parties share the same interest in control, enforcement mechanisms holding the other party accountable are less pertinent. Admittedly, this explanation can be refuted by the fact that sending and receiving countries may have in mind different types of control, and Val will talk about that in a second, which may still require parties to ensure that the agreements are binding. Yet we believe the control thesis at least begins to provide an answer to this question. Finally, this explains their secrecy. If one of the key interests other than establishing a formal migration corridor is in the policing and control of workers and recruiters and other issues, issues such as migrant workers' rights are secondary, then these agreements are clearly not intended for public consumption and the reasons to avoid transparency are clearer. Moreover, understanding the political economy of shared interests uh, uh, of sending and receiving countries in such a, in such control is key to understanding the potential BLAs may hold to advance other goals, such as to enhance and protect workers' rights, when these goals happen to coalesce with both countries' interest in control. However, this will require case-specific contextual analysis of the interests at play, and it's clearly not the case in each country dyad. Okay, so now Yuval will turn to develop and give some examples of our control thesis and how we hope it can be productive. So Yuval, on to you. Thanks. Can I uh, change slides or you'll help me with I'll, that? I'll help you. Okay, so can go to the next slide. Thanks. So um, what we try to understand is why, as, as, as Hila said, the control thesis is all about sending countries and not only receiving countries uh, having an interest to control their own nationals and also, in some senses, the migration industry. So what are, why do sending countries wish to control their nationals? There are several um, uh, reasons we identified throughout reading uh, uh, the BLAs. One is to ensure the, the continued flow of uh, migrants under temporary migrant workers programs. This is, you know, uh, literature has written over and over again. Uh, again, uh, remittances is the main cause for sending countries to send their nationals uh, uh, abroad. So, in the, so, so that's why, in a sense, uh, sending countries want to ensure timely return of the nationals back home and to ensure their overall good behavior because they want to be on the good side of the receiving countries in order for them to accept more and more of their nationals as uh, temporary migrant workers. Uh, in that sense, it, it kind of the interest of this of the receiving country becomes the interest of the sending country as well. But I still think it's in, we still thought it's interesting because. It's, if we talk about uh, sending countries wishing to protect the labor rights of the, their nationals, now it's not protecting the labor rights of each individual, but it's all of an overall thing of seeing that, uh, you know, and sometimes we have to sacrifice maybe the workers' rights of individual migrant workers in order to ensure the overall big number of uh, nationals going abroad. So in, in this sense, the rights versus numbers thesis also works and uh, also persuades uh, or, or reflects also the, the interests of, of sending countries as well. They want as many nationals to go abroad. They're more interested in that than in the 
particular uh, right of individual migrant. It also, uh, sending countries also wish to enhance the country's economic development and growth, and that's why sometimes they wish to control the recruitment agencies, which take high recruitment fees, etc. Of course, some of them are corrupt, and this money goes to their government. But sometimes, if we look, we, or at least this is something we want to investigate some more, because the recruitment uh, uh, um, industry usually does not lead to uh, economic growth. And uh, these workers have to pay to recruiters instead of having more money to send back to their families. And this is the main goal of the sending countries. So we at least hypothesize. Then sometimes they want to protect other uh, foreign policy or other interests that we'll show in a second. And finally, some of them are merely authoritarian or semi-authoritarian. So, you know, authoritarian countries don't like sometimes their nationals to be out of sight and they want to control them and monitor them even when they go abroad. Then we, uh, I'll delve into some examples. So if we talk about uh, ensuring uh, about timely return of migrants, first of all, we can see that some countries such as Nepal, Vietnam and others already unitarily uh, uh, require the citizen to post bonds. So before they go on TMPW's uh, temporary migrant workers program, sorry, uh, they have to uh, post a bond that they will get back only when they return back home to ensure their timely return. So these countries started doing it unilaterally already. And we can see this reflected in some BLAs as well. For example, the Israeli Sri Lanka one here, you can see that it's, it stipulates that Sri Lankan workers shall sign a declaration and provide guarantees to ensure timely return. And this is something that both countries sign or the South Korean BLAs stipulating that if uh, there are too many overstayers from one country, then South Korea will, will accept less of them in the future. So this is a kind of uh, an incentive uh, for uh, nationals uh, to go back home and for the sending country uh, as well to make sure that they return home in order for the continued flow, from, uh, flow of workers from this country. Reputation becomes even more interesting because some countries kind of brand themselves or brand their uh, uh, workers to, to use maybe extreme words as docile, uh, diligent, sometimes even servile workers. And we can see this some, in order again to ensure as many of them going abroad. Uh, and we can see some examples uh, of that. For example, we see how uh, different, uh, se several BLAs uh, from the Gulf and elsewhere, elsewhere says that uh, before uh, a worker can go to court against his or her employer, they must go through the diplomatic uh, channels. So uh, the first quotation from the Jordan Sri Lanka BLA, parties shall in the first instance ask, uh, act as intermediaries for resolving in a friendly matter any dispute between the worker and the employer. And also only later on, if this doesn't work, the worker can supposedly go to the court system. Yuval, can I ask you to start wrapping up? Sure. Oh. <laughs> and then even uh, uh, more uh, poignant is uh, uh, um, articles in BLS that say that uh, uh, the sending countries will make sure that there are no runaways or if a, a national of their own runs to the embassy, they will notify the uh, other, uh, the, the receiving country. Pilar, can you move on to that? Okay, great, thanks. Other interests, I'll just give a quick example. For example, in Israeli Ch Chinese BLA, uh, there's a, uh, there was a lot of negotiation about China saying that it's not willing the, uh, that the, their, uh, where its workers will work in the occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, so there's a, a, um, a, an article to that extent. Uh, and there's also we, we, another completely different example is the Philippines Bahrain. BLA, which stipulates that um, Bahrain will allow scholarship programs for students in health studies. The idea being that once they study in Bahrain and then go back, and the BLA talks about them going back to work in the, in the, in the Philippines, they will teach other Filipino workers how to be good health workers, and then more health workers from the Philippines will come to, uh, to Bahrain. So this is an interest both of Bahrain and of the Philippines. Finally, authoritarian countries, we can see, for example, in the China-Israeli BLA, that it requires not only that workers would not have uh, um, uh, criminal records, which is uh, uh, very uh, widespread in BLAs, uh, 
uh, pre uh, prevalent in, in BLAs, but also the, a good credit that a Chinese worker with a bad credit would not be allowed into Israel. And this is a good example of China and it's all a, a social credit system uh, and, not, and, and uh, penetrating into BLAs. So the Chinese government will say, if you have a bad credit, you will not be able to be working abroad as a migrant worker. So that's a completely Chinese own uh, interest and not Israel's interest in any sense. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll go into this kind of last uh, slide quickly. Last um, minute, okay? Okay, so, so then we go into the normative. So far, we try to explain that it's an explanatory theory. Uh, what interest uh, do uh, um, BLAs reflect? But then we try to think of how can we use this uh, um, notion, this understanding to protect workers' rights. So as Ilha said, we will be able to protect our workers' rights only if the rights kind of coalesce with both uh, the rights of, of the, with both the interests of the sending country and the receiving country. So if, if for example, you know, we'll, we'll convince the receiving country that, um, that money transfer, remittances transfers uh, implicate uh, um, crime organizations, let's say in the receiving country, then this is a good enough uh, reason for the receiving country maybe to fight this phenomenon. And by the way, it will help uh, migrant workers to pay less uh, transfer fees. Or if we uh, convince both uh, uh, sending and receiving country uh, uh, to include certain things uh, in the orientation or training programs, pre-departure and post-departure, then maybe this will be a good thing for these workers themselves to uh, get uh, different occupational skills. Or, and this okay. is the last uh, example that I go through very quickly, uh, if, for example, we think, and this is what we think in Traflab, uh, that uh, uh, serious exploitation of labor rights is, is tantamount to trafficking, and we convince a country that this, or a court in a country, that this is really trafficking, and therefore the victims of extreme exp labor, exp labor law exploitation are entitled to uh, rehabilitation visas, then maybe in this sense, the receiving country will say, well, we don't want to give them too many rehabilitation visas. And therefore we have to fight extreme uh, exploitation. So this is kind of the way that we can, con it's not really for the protection of workers' rights, but if we convince either the sending country or the receiving country that the workers' rights coalesce with their own interests, maybe that's a way to go forward. I want enough, okay. have enough time to go to the Israeli uh, uh, example. Maybe you've read about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuval and Hila. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, the respondent, who is Nicola uh, Piper from uh, Queen Mary University in London. Please, Nicola. Sorry, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, first of all, it's a great pleasure to see you all and Hila now also both in, in person, you know, after having read um, this fascinating paper. Um, and if I just may start in a way, I suppose, pointing out the obvious, my reading of the paper is obviously influenced by my own interests and well expertise or lack thereof, you know, not being a legal scholar. Um, but I, I did uh, really enjoy it. It was um, a, a really, really interesting paper. Um, fully packed, um, lots of, uh, you know, different angles explored, um, which sort of demonstrates really the complexity of bilateral agreements and the different, you know, the, the, the many, many different um, dimensions involved. Um, and uh, in, in, in this slide, um, I sort of thought I've just kind of quickly summarized the key uh, messages, um, hopefully in not too simplistic um, a manner. So I, I guess the starting point um, really was, you know, why have, uh, you know, bilateral agreements gained in popularity um, and, and raising um, this specific puzzle, which remains largely unexplained by existing um, uh, studies, the secrecy bilateral agreements are shrouded in their non-binding and unenforceable un uh, nature. And, um, and, and based on uh, analyzing um, um, bilateral, uh, a certain number of agreements, as well as on reanalyzing uh, and, and seeing through 
um, the existing um, literature on bilateral agreements. I'm just not going to say the authors just to avoid saying Hila and you guys. So I know it sounds a little bit too formal. I'm sorry about this. But uh, the, the paper identifies, you know, migration origin and destination countries clearly both having an interest in signing bilateral agreements, um, you know, often for slightly different reasons, but by and large, one thing that um, uh, uh, combines or, or is an overarching interest is explained by um, what you suggest as the control thesis, yeah? so the desire on the part of countries of origin and destination for controlling and policing the movement and actions of migrant workers. Um, as well as at times to curtail the negative spillovers of the unlawful or exploitative migration industry, which you know has um, developed around labor migration. Um, and uh, I think, um, therefore, it's it's safe to say it's it's fair to say um, you know it's uh, what can be added here is the broader and more general desire on the part of governments to control the design and implementation of migration policies which have, uh, you know, generally as in, on a global trend uh, level, uh, become more selective and rigid, uh, you know, providing incomplete freedom of movement, to say the least, uh, across borders, as well as lacking freedom of mobility within labor markets, so hence uh, the control um, thesis. Now, um, the and what I personally really um, uh, liked also about the paper is the uh, it's not merely uh, based on an analysis of the reasons for which countries sign uh, bilateral agreements, but also the normative aspects and dimensions involved in bilateral agreements in relation to you know migrant rights, the um, uh, opportunity uh, you know to use them also for protecting migrant rights, and the important question as to you know, uh, uh, can they actually be a tool for migrate, migrant rights protection? Uh, should they be a tool? Can they be a tool? Um, and if so, you know, uh, how? Um, now, uh, for those of you who have uh, read um, the paper, you would have seen the uh, initial, uh, the, the um, um, by paragraph uh, edited where uh, the authors ask uh, for specific comments on uh, two, th three things really, and I'm gonna focus on two of them. One is the control thesis. So the question really is, is it convincing? And the second, um, and, and you well, unfortunately, he didn't have a lot of time to talk about the Israeli case study, whether it does make a good fit uh, or possibly should um, be dropped. Now, generally speaking, um, you know, and I, I would like to use those two questions also to guide my, um, you know, um, little a few thoughts on, you know, how to, um, yeah, uh, to address this paper. So what I would say um, to both questions is actually, I, I would say yes to both questions. Um, so the control thesis to me is uh, convincing, um, very much so. And um, I would also personally say uh, the Israeli case study is actually really, really good and should stay. And I, 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 I say in a minute um, as to why I think so. Um, I guess uh, as somebody who um, has worked um, primarily, you know, the last 20 years primarily on global migration governance and having looked at, you know, how um, bilateral agreements fit into the overall global governance of labor migration, where you obviously um, look at it more from a globally aggregate, um, uh, not a globally aggregate level, but more from the point of view of, of how the discourse on the global multilateral level is being um, framed. Um, I put, from that point of view, I actually really liked um, the Israeli case study, because as somebody, you know, who knows more about the global level, I often ask myself, you know, how does this really work, the nitty gritty, uh, 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 how, 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 how does it actually work uh, in, well, on, on, the, on, the, on the ground, so to speak, the national level, but in relation to, as the authors also quite rightly point out, it's, it's in a transnational space between countries of origin and uh, countries um, of destination. Um, so in this uh, context, I personally find um, the Israeli case study really interesting. Um, and also because um, 
as as far as I read it, um, the Israeli case um, is, you know, because I'm also kind of was uh, looking all the time also in terms of what um, methods and methodology um, has been used in order to, you know, add to existing literature, cre create some novel uh, insights. And what I personally found fascinating, and again, I guess this is the um, social scientists talking here, is um, the, uh, um, the 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 uh, looking at uh, court proceedings and and legal. Uh, cases and uh, invoking, um, as far as I understand, um, what has actually happened in Israel is the invoking of anti-trafficking legislation, and in doing so, migrant rights are again necessarily a selective affair since trafficking addresses only certain rights issues, but not the whole gamut. And and, and again, uh, you know, as uh, Jennifer has also um, alluded to, less of what actually happens at the workplace in terms of labor rights. But very interestingly, here also. So the point, um, because we were also talking, hearing earlier about the complex um, dynamics between the national, the, 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 the bilateral or transnational as well as global um, dynamics. Um, interesting here uh, is also anti-trafficking policy uh, and legislation is in many ways also externally, I probably imposed is too strong a word, but um, the US tips reporting system having here an, an, an important um, uh, uh, influence in in, 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 you know, uh, uh, influencing Israelis' um, legal and policy um, response to uh, um, illicit uh, migration and, and also the, the um, workings of the migration, um, uh, the, the recruitment um, industry. Um, so from that point of view, uh, and also for, as someone who you know, has worked mostly on the, on the global level, the, the idea of control as such isn't actually surprising. So from that point of view, you know, it is part of this whole migration management paradigm. Um, and it's, you know, well demonstrated as you have also, of course, shown in the literature review part. So the securitization and economic development of Approaches. They are sort of subsumed under this migration management discourse. And the phrasing, phrasing of many, if not most, bilateral agreements reflects exactly that. And interesting then is to how to reconcile these different aspects of migration, now meeting the development objectives, security uh, objectives, the prevention of irregular migration, the economic needs, you know, the income generating workforce, the, and also the human and labor rights of migrants, you know, as, you know, uh, countries are, you know, supposed to do so according to international human and labor rights obligations um, and uh, to, you know to ultimately then also stop what's often referred to as modern forms of slavery and definitely labor exploitation and, and then even more importantly how to you know in relation to temporary contract migration how to do this within the transnational sphere of jurisdiction and institutional operations where you know it's not just one single country that's uh, sort of in in, in charge of uh, you know, um, making sense and, and, and regulating um, this um, space, uh, which also then, you know, brings us back to what Jennifer alluded to, you know, this, the, the whole issue of actors, you know, how these different actors uh, come into this. So the ultimate question, I suppose, whether bilateral agreements can be a vehicle for fair and ethical recruitment in relation to hiring and employment practices is a very important and vital uh, question to ask. What can they do? what can't they do, what can't they be expected to do, uh, and what wider institutional architecture and legal frameworks in which they are embedded is needed to make them work, uh, unless, of course, one wants to go as far as saying, well, actually, they shouldn't really be used at all. So what other criteria beyond bilateral agreements are important factors um, in this space, um, so to speak? And um, uh, political regimes have been alluded to democratic principles, so I guess, and this is, again, the context where I personally think Israel is really interesting where you know it is in many ways um, if you like a liberal democracy with an independent judiciary so how here uh, you know legal proceedings legal court cases can in actual fact um, make at least a little difference, even if, as you quite rightly say, it's sort of been a bit disappointing, you know, it, it, it could go uh, further. So to me here really the very, very interesting um, uh, yeah, uh, case study uh, on the national level, and this is what's why I personally thought Israel is actually a really, really interesting um, example, uh, which I personally think you might want to 
place at the core of the paper and 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 you know even start with it and then see you know how does this fit into the uh, global within you know in the global space the global trends uh, we see emerging um and uh, really look at the complexity of the institutional dynamics uh using mm -hmm. israel and Nicola, maybe, i can ask you to start yes. wrapping up as well I sorry. shall wrap up exactly here because I'm in actual fact already at the end. So sorry for um, uh, yeah uh, going. On. I have made a few uh, um, um, sort of comments in the paper itself, which I sent to you. For example, one of the things I was really intrigued by is also why Israel started signing uh, more and more bilateral agreements at a certain historical point in time. Um, having just recently uh, returned from Australia, uh, many of you might know Australia has a working holiday maker program, which is officially not a bilateral agreement, labor agreement, but it's sort of a hidden uh, form of bilateral agreement. And this sort of reminded me of the kibbutz system. Has that maybe changed? So Israel no longer has agricultural workers through kibbutz. Anyway, that's and you know a small sideline question but it's just sort of in any case i found the paper really really interesting it's fully packed there are in my mind in actual fact almost two if not even more papers in it i personally really like the control thesis which can be um deepened i suppose in many ways uh and i personally would definitely leave israel in it but this is my my you know um Take coming from you know a level that is has, you know mostly um, dealt with global and less with um, you know national dynamics. I stop here. Sorry for rambling on. Thank you so much, uh, Nicola. This was great. Um, Hilanival, we have seven minutes and one hand up. Uh, do you want to quickly respond and then we'll take questions? Yeah, just quickly maybe. So first of all, thank you, Nicola, for reading the paper so carefully. Um, so the reason we were uncertain about the Israeli case study is because we make such a big deal out of sending countries interest and then we end up studying a receiving country. <laughs> and Yosef, who is here with us, is nodding because as our research assistant, he knows the problems we had in this. Um, the truth is that we could not find a rich case study that others have done on, on receiving countries, on sending countries, sorry, except Yahel, who's here as well. So we cite Yahel extensively. Um, but if any of you know of that, please let us know so we can maybe use it. We would like to look at the Ethiopian case. We would like to look at the Indonesian case. We just didn't find enough out there. So maybe we just didn't know. So we'd love to hear more about that. Um, yeah, the Israeli case, uh, You, all of you who will stick with us will hear a lot more about it because yeah, and know we know we'll be discussing it. And of course, Nona and Rivka were the uh, the, the main scholars of this uh, uh, of this field, so um, in Israel. So uh, you know there there will be more to learn in this conference if you're if you're interested in that. So but let's take questions. Yeah, unless Yuval, if you want to say something. No, no, please uh, let's take another question. Thank you so much, Nicola, for your uh, review and comments. Perfect, um, Adam T. Uh, so first off, um, what I really like about this paper is it does a great job of bringing in uh, all, most at least, of the stylized facts on BLAs from various papers and projects over the last few years and lays them all out before going out to build the control thesis. And I thought it was just really well done. And in part, I agree with uh, Nicola. I liked the Israeli case study because it was new stylized facts, at least to me, even the ones, although it's drawing on some prior papers and other research the uh, similar case studies that will be presented at this conference. But I like both laying out the existing stylized facts and then building to that sort of set of information through doing a receiving state case study. The question that I have about the control thesis though um, is uh, how we can make sense of this um, sort of paradox it leaves us with, which is the paper lays out uh, the evidence that in many instances, BLAs have not done that much when it's being limited. And for instance, in the Israeli example, where it's cur um, curbed the recruiter's fees, but hasn't done a lot on various rights violations or, or, um, or other aspects of the, the migration experience. And so the question then is, um, if the goal of the treaties is to get control of the illicit recruitment industry, and it does have some impact on that, why doesn't it then change the political support or calculation for migration in ways that would lead to subsequent changes? So if you get your you get the illicit industry under control, why aren't people in favor of more migration or perhaps less 
um, now that the, the costs are more transparent and clear and, and better regulated. Uh, so that's, I guess, uh, where I'm left. Shouldn't the control thesis imply secondary effects that, that we haven't fully found? Uh, do you want us to answer now, uh, Tamar, or to collect several? Okay. Uh, no, this is the only hand up at the moment, so maybe you should answer. And if there are any others who are with, who want to make a comment, please raise your hand. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll start it if that's okay. I think, uh, you know, the, the control thesis talks about, uh, you know, the, the wish of a country in certain situations to control uh, either the mobility or uh, of workers or, uh, uh, or to monitor their acts or to uh, control the recruit, the illicit uh, uh, business industry. Now they don't, they don't always go hand in hand so, or they don't always lead to the same uh, uh, outcomes. So for example, in Israel, I think uh, for a long time, um, Israel didn't care so much about controlling the recruitment agencies. They did a lot of money uh, but it didn't come at the expense of uh, anyone else other than the migrant workers. And Israel didn't care so much or enough about the interests of migrant workers. So as long as it didn't impact Israel itself, it didn't have a strong enough incentive to control it. At some point, as we write, first of all, there was a, a serious pressure on Israel uh, from the TIPRE report and the Israeli Supreme Court. And also Israel realized that it's, it loses its control on the borders, because first of all, these uh, the greed of the uh, recruitment agencies became so great that they started bringing in more and more unnecessary workers. They brought in unskilled workers, and the uh, Ministry of Interior could not control them. They 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 kind of outsmarted the Ministry of Interior in the control uh, in their border control. So that's one thing. The second, th of, the, th the second thing is that the judiciary started telling the Minister of Interior, well, we are gonna, you want to deport this Chinese man, for example, but look, he didn't even have enough time to return the excessive recruitment fees that he paid. And this seems like inhumane to us. And therefore, you know, you shouldn't deport it. It's excessively unreasonable. And therefore, in that sense, the, the, in, in the Israeli context, at least at that point, it felt that it's losing control. Before that, there was no realization that it loses control either vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the, the private sector in, that brought in more and more were unnecessary workers to, to, to Israeli territories or vis-a-vis -vis the judiciary that interfered with the Ministry of Interior or the government's discretion. So at that point, there was a strong enough incentive or control, incentive, control type of incentive to, to, to stop these recruitment agencies. You can't say the same about uh, labor rights of the Thai or the Chinese workers. Here, uh, they, the, the, Israelis, the Israeli government cares more about controlling that the uh, Israeli employers maybe don't pay too much or that you know, the price of fruits uh, is not, and vegetables is not too high. Or they, so they don't have a strong enough incentive, either control or otherwise, to protect uh, migrant workers. So, so that's why it, it, it went in different directions in the Israeli uh, example. And one, and controlling the, the, in the recruitment and industry does not necessarily entail that Israel now wishes to control or to protect workers' rights. Okay, Hila, uh, if I could intervene, oh, are we almost out of time. Uh, maybe we can take one more question and then have you. Yeah, I just uh, want to quickly talk. respond by, I, I do okay. want just to add a sentence and say that it did, I think, in fact, change um, again in the Israeli context and that we need to learn more about what's happening in the sending countries. But, but in the Israeli context, for example, in agriculture, um, uh, it opened up a whole new economy of, uh, not a whole new, but expanded significantly an economy of students. Um, so instead of, of, of uh, workers, now we, we get uh, students. So instead of 500 students who used to come in, now we have 4,000 of them. How come? Who's making money? They pay tuition fees to work in Israeli fields. Um, so this changed the, uh, the, the um, it changed the, the migration industry and the political economy and the actual economy around this. Uh, but it didn't change it in the ways that you mentioned. So it didn't, it just kind of found ways to go 
uh, around the bilateral agreements. And we can give other examples of kind of ways to go around bilateral agreements that developed in Israel, both in construction and in agriculture. And it remains to be seen what we will see in care work. But again, it will be very interesting for us to learn what happened in Thailand. And for example, the I is an example of the country that signed a bilateral agreement, the oldest one with Israel. And we know that the IOM, the International Organization on Migration, that was assigned to it, stepped out. What will happen now in Thailand? So there's a very rich case study, you know, with maybe uh, Sudarat, who is here with us, uh, um, and, and Shahar and Yehel, others who are studying this can, can tell us uh, more about. Um, so there is change, but not in a positive way, I guess. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, one uh, very quick, please, last question for Madame Hasper. Hi, yeah, I'll be very, very brief. I'm sorry for not having a, a, a video. Um, so we, the framing of control seems very labor-like uh, and human-centered. Um, and when I think about from the, the sending uh, country's perspective, if they don't care about worker protection, I'm not sure they're thinking about the workers as persons and pe people at, at all. Maybe they do think of them as bananas. Um, and and if, uh, if, it, if control the right way of framing it, and maybe it's just a capital kind of, of way how to make the investment of the workers, of the labor, not of the workers, of the labor, uh, to be, uh, uh, to keep the flow going, to maximize it, to optimize it, et cetera, uh, which doesn't always go in, into the direction of control. Sometimes the, the, the point is seeding control and just making, creating the structure for the market and for um, other forces to control it. So you just have the best return on your investment. Hello, do you want to take it? Or? Yeah, I'll just say briefly, mostly because we, we, I think, really need to go on break. Um, so thank you, Alon, for this question. I, I, I don't think the sending countries do not care about their workers' rights of the, of, the, of the workers they send. I think they care about it very much in some way. And in others, uh, uh, they're, they're thinking um, you know, about wider economic concerns than uh, the individual person. But I do want to say that the control that we see via BLAs and that Yuval gave examples of is actually extremely personal. It's of the person violating the visa. It's of the person who is uh, um, um, expressing themselves or behaving in a way that doesn't seem uh, appropriate or, or represent well the country or serve its brand. It's not that general. It is actually, I mean, there also, there's a general need to control migration, but we know the BLA is, you know, it's, it's a tool of governance. They want to do that. I think what we try to add is beyond that. It's not just that kind of control. So I actually do think that we actually aim for an individualized um, to bring back the, to show the need of, of sending countries to really control individual workers and just kind of similarly or akin to how receiving countries want to do that. I don't know if you want, you all want to add something. Yes. So thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Hila and Yuval, and thank you to Nikolai, and thank you to all of you. Uh, we will now uh, leave for a quick uh, coffee break. Uh, and we'll be back uh, at 10 uh, to uh, the hour uh, to continue speaking about liminal spaces. So thank you very much. <laughs>